Simple Scientist, the podcast dedicated to helping us optimize our health with the latest scientific findings on nutrition, health, and medicine. I, your host, Dr. Stephanie Caligiuri, will be here with you every single week, bringing us information to ignite our thinking to help us be one step closer to the healthiest we can be. And welcome back to the People Scientist Podcast. This week I am so excited because we are covering a massive topic, and that is intermittent fasting and the ketogenic diet. Within these two topics that we are going to cover, I'm also going to discuss weight loss, neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, mood disorders such as depression and anxiety, as well as cancer. Because there is so much information on these topics that I want to share with all of you, I've decided that I'm going to split this topic into two episodes. So this is part one, and there's also going to be a part two. In part one, I'm going to cover more of the ketogenic diet, and in part two, I'll cover more of intermittent fasting. The reason why I find the topic so fascinating is because it literally flies in the face of nutritional dogma in the last several decades. For years, we were taught that carbohydrates should be the number one source of energy in our diet and that we should eat every three to four hours to keep our blood sugar levels stable. But the ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting is the exact opposite of that. So why has the nutrition world started to change its way of thinking? In this two-part episode, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know. So let's first start off by introducing the ketogenic diet to everyone. Well, firstly, I combine the topics of the ketogenic diet and fasting together because they really do go hand in hand. The reason being the ketogenic diet is what we call a fasting mimetic diet, meaning it mimics us being in a fasted state. Now, classically, as determined by the International Ketogenic Diet Group, a ketogenic diet is 90% of your calories coming from fat. So it is very minimal in carbohydrates with less than 30 grams a day, and the remaining percentage of calories coming from protein. Therefore, the ketogenic diet is quite unique in that it forces our body to burn fat for energy, as opposed to using carbs and glucose for energy. Now, in comparison to a regular carbohydrate low-calorie diet, the ketogenic diet keeps us in a constant state of ketogenesis, meaning that we are constantly burning fat for energy. As a result, this creates a large shift in our metabolism. Now, it's called a ketogenic diet, meaning that we are generating ketones. So ketones are generated from the fat that we eat, or they're generated from the fat that is stored in our body. Now, when I say that this diet is mimicking us being in a fasted state, it's because the amount of carbs and protein we are consuming is so low. When we eat carbohydrates or protein, it causes our body to release insulin. Now, insulin is what I'd like to call the building storage hormone of our body. Insulin causes muscle growth and storage of fat. But when insulin levels are low, the other hormone, so-called the breaking down or fasting hormone, glucagon, is elevated. Now, these two hormones are always in balance with one another. Now, glucagon stimulates muscle breakdown and fat breakdown in order to release energy. Therefore, because the ketogenic diet is very low in protein and carbs, insulin levels remain very low. And fat does not stimulate insulin secretion. So as a result, it mimics us being in a fasted state. Insulin levels remain low and glucagon is higher. As a result, when we are on this diet, a lot of fat and muscle is broken down for energy metabolism. Now, this diet has actually been around for a long time. It was first developed back in the 1910s for children with refractory epilepsy. So this meant that unfortunately, the children that were diagnosed with epilepsy were not responding well to medications. As a result, the physicians and scientists decided to develop a diet that would hopefully help prevent their seizures. And as a result, when the children followed this ketogenic diet, over two thirds of the children saw drastic improvements in the number and severity of their seizures. But how did the ketogenic diet accomplish this? Well, as I had mentioned, the ketogenic diet is quite unique and that it forces our body to burn fat for energy and causes a large shift in our metabolism. This large shift also changes the energy movement and metabolism in our brain. When we follow the ketogenic diet, it actually decreases the activation and increases the inhibition of neural activity in the brain. Because glutamate, 
the brain's main excitatory neurotransmitter is intrinsically linked to seizures within the children with epilepsy. As a result, the physicians wanted to decrease the excitation or the glutamate in the brain and increase the inhibition or the neurotransmitter GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Now this mechanism in how the ketogenic diet helps epilepsy is actually quite fascinating because it may also have the potential then to benefit people living with mood disorders, such as depression and anxiety. Now, typically drugs for depression and anxiety have focused on the neurotransmitter serotonin, but scientists lately like Gerard Sanacora are being proponents that to treat depression and anxiety, we should start to focus on the neurotransmitter GABA and glutamate. Now, as I mentioned, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that quiets down our brain activity, while glutamate is the excitatory neurotransmitter that activates our brain regions. Now, Liz Moore in 2018 illustrated that mood disorders such as anxiety and depression are characterized by having reduced inhibition or reduced GABA in the cortex of the brain. So if the ketogenic diet, as it had done in epilepsy, can increase GABA in the brain, maybe it has therapeutic potential for some mood disorders. But let me reiterate that this is a medical hypothesis and it's only in its beginnings. There are a few animal studies that have looked at the ketogenic diet and measures of depression. Sussman in 2014 and Oliviera in 2008, for example, showed that a ketogenic diet can reduce excitability in the cortex of the brain and that these benefits can actually be transferred down to the offspring in rodents. But clinically, what we do know is that some antidepressant drugs are actually also anticonvulsant drugs that are used to treat epilepsy as well. These drugs appear to raise GABA levels in the cortex and essentially reverse the GABA deficits that we see in depression, anxiety, and epilepsy. So these drugs may work by the same mechanism as the ketogenic diet. Now, I find this medical hypothesis to be absolutely fascinating as the ketogenic diet can change the metabolism in such a way that we can change the energy metabolism in our brain and thus the excitability of our neurons and perhaps thus have mood stabilizing effects. But let me disclaim here that if you are diagnosed with depression and require medications, please do not go off your medications and try this diet as that can be quite dangerous. So please speak to your physician first and perhaps they can create a protocol for you where you attempt this diet and stay on the medications for better control. Okay, so now there's also interest in the ketogenic diet and weight loss. So let's jump right into that topic. Now, essentially, as I said, the ketogenic diet keeps us in a fasting state where we are constantly burning the fat we eat or the fat that is stored in our body for energy. In short, the clinical data looking at the beneficial effects of the ketogenic diet are sparse. Some clinical trials do show that lower carbohydrate diets in general can have greater satiety, meaning greater feeling of fullness or less hunger, less cravings, and slightly more weight loss when compared to a low calorie regular carbohydrate diet. But do keep in mind that once going back to a regular well-balanced diet that has more carbohydrates or protein, a lot of water and glycogen weight will be regained. So again, it is possible that a ketogenic diet can help with weight loss, but rapid weight regain is also very common. So let's jump into the topic of a ketogenic diet and neurodegenerative diseases such as dementia and Alzheimer's. Now, I'm going to also talk about dementia and Alzheimer's in part two of this episode with intermittent fasting. There is some very interesting data coming out looking at ketones or ketone bodies for improving cognition in dementia. Now, as I mentioned earlier, ketones are produced from fat in our body or from the fat we eat for energy. But we can also consume ketones themselves or increase the production of ketones by taking medium chain triglyceride oils or called MCT oils. Now MCT oils typically contain carbon eight and carbon 10 fatty acids that are also called capric and caprylic acid. Now these fatty acids in particular are quite interesting because they can escape the digestion of our intestines and enter into our circulation intact. Now when they make their way to our liver, they are rapidly converted into ketones for energy. So we have shown many times that MCT oils do in fact increase ketones in the blood very quickly. Now some people may think that coconut oil is an MCT oil, 
But coconut oil actually contains mostly that carbon-12 fatty acid, lauric acid, which is characterized as a medium-chain triglyceride, but it actually acts more like a long-chain fatty acid because it is not converted into ketones as effectively as the carbon-8 and carbon-10 fatty acid. So many of the clinical trials looking at MCT oil and dementia use a blend of carbon-8 and carbon-10 fatty acids. Now, Alzheimer's and dementia are hallmarked by impaired glucose and energy metabolism by the neurons in the brain. So if the neurons in the brain do not have enough energy, the brain does not function as usual. Now, as I said before, our body uses either glucose or ketone bodies for energy. And as a result, those that have dementia are not using glucose properly to fuel their brain, resulting in a cognitive function decline. So as hypothesis that if these patients that are living with dementia are also provided ketones or MCT oil as a secondary fuel source, that perhaps their cognitive function would improve. You know, in fact, in a very small pilot study by Robello et al. in 2015, had illustrated that adding 56 grams a day of medium chain triglyceride oils over 24 weeks without even following a ketogenic diet, but simply adding the MCT oil to a regular diet, did rapidly result in an increase in ketones in the blood and did indeed increase cognitive function in those with early dementia. Now, the concept of those with dementia to follow the ketogenic diet has not been reported. There are clinical trials currently underway assessing this, for example, in the Kansas Medical Center, which hopefully will be published soon. Now, it is possible that there is benefit of the ketogenic diet on dementia, but it's also possible that it won't help because dementia is very complex. Now, one of the drugs used to treat dementia is memantine, which is a glutamate receptor blocker. It reduces the activity of that excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. If you remember, I said the ketogenic diet can also reduce the excitatory potential of glutamate as well. So maybe the ketogenic diet does have benefit in those living with dementia. But we also know in the opposite that dementia is hallmarked by reduced neuron activity. So the inhibitory effects of the ketogenic diet may be detrimental in dementia. To be honest, I wish I had the answer for you here if the ketogenic diet would be helpful in dementia, but right now we simply do not know the effects and hopefully those results will be published soon. But rather, instead of the ketogenic diet, what we do know is that if you add MCT oil to a regular diet, which increases the ketones in our blood, it adds a secondary fuel source to the neurons in our brain, increasing the availability of energy, which has been shown in a pilot study to improve cognition in early dementia. Now, another topic in the ketogenic diet for the bodybuilding world is there's a bit of a debate as to whether or not muscle can be gained while being on the ketogenic diet. So the short answer is, if you're following the classical ketogenic diet, which is 90% of your calories coming from fat, the answer is no. Because on that type of diet, the insulin levels are so minimal. And as I said, insulin is the building hormone that is responsible for muscle growth and fat storage. So if you're following the classical ketogenic diet, you're actually going to be losing muscle mass, which has been shown in many clinical trials, even in populations of athletes. More commonly, though, people will follow a modified version of the ketogenic diet, which has more protein. And we know protein stimulates insulin. So achieving a state of ketosis with a lot more protein being added to the added to the diet is more difficult, but you certainly can achieve muscle growth with a higher proportion of protein in the diet and is an easier alternative to the classical ketogenic diet. Now, if you are thinking about trying out the ketogenic diet, there are some very important things to consider. Firstly, there are some side effects to the diet. The most common side effect is an increase in cholesterol levels due to the high fat nature. Now, this has been illustrated in many clinical trials across different populations, but there is one way to avoid this or to attenuate it. And that's because of one very important fact. If you are following the ketogenic diet strictly with very little carbs and protein, the fat you will consume will not be stored in your body. But if you are eating more calories than you're burning, where do you think the fat will go? The fat's not being stored, the fat's not being burned, it's going to stay in your blood, in your circulation, circulating around in your body. As a result, that's why it's increasing your cholesterol levels. So if you're going to follow the ketogenic diet, please don't think that you can eat an unlimited amount of fat. 
you still have to eat within your certain energy restrictions of what your body requires. Otherwise, you're going to increase your blood cholesterol levels and you're going to increase your risk of heart disease, particularly if that cholesterol becomes oxidized from free radicals or inflammation and thus creating atherosclerotic plaques, narrowing your arteries and increasing your risk of heart disease. So the way to avoid that is don't think you can eat as much fat as you want. You still have to stay within the certain boundaries of your calorie needs. Now, other side effects of the ketogenic diet have been noted. For example, it has been shown that this diet can cause difficulty sleeping in the beginning, constipation, and in children with epilepsy that were following this diet, they observed an increased risk of osteoporosis, delayed growth, delayed puberty onset, and decreased gonadotropins, which are sex hormones that are responsible for sexual reproduction. The ketogenic diet is also very restrictive and cuts out a lot of healthy foods, such as whole grains, beans, legumes, and fruits. Because the diet is so restrictive, there are many nutrient deficiencies that have been observed. For example, in a lot of case studies, they have found severe deficiencies in copper, selenium, magnesium, calcium, vitamin D, vitamin A, and vitamin C. And of course, these nutrient deficiencies can have some serious health side effects. Because of this diet's restrictive nature, some studies show that it is best to, to cycle through a ketogenic diet and a well-balanced diet, and not to stay on the ketogenic diet long term. Now, when cycling through it, it is best not to go from a ketogenic diet to a really high-carb diet, as that is a very drastic change, but rather to go from a keto diet to, say, a 30 to 40% carbohydrate diet. The ketogenic diet can be used in place of intermittent fasting. Now we'll go more into the details of the ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting in part two of this episode. So if you're going to attempt this diet, there are a few important things to consider. First off, don't do the dirty keto diet. By dirty keto, I mean eating a ton of animal fats like bacon, grease, and butter. I see people on social media toting their ketogenic diet regimen and how they eat a pound of bacon for breakfast. Please don't do this and please don't be fooled into thinking that this is healthy. Instead, get your fat sources primarily from plants. For example, flax oil, flaxseed, hemp seed, avocados, coconut oil, nuts, nut butters, medium chain triglyceride oils. But I'm not the only one to think that plants are a healthier source of fat than animals, as there's a huge landmark clinical trial that was published in 2010 in the Annals of Internal Medicine that showed a low-carbohydrate diet that is high in animal sources of protein and fat significantly increased the risk of all-cause mortality, particularly increasing the risk of colorectal cancer and increasing the risk of death from heart disease. Now, this was an observational trial done in over 80,000 women and in over 40,000 men. However, interestingly, when a low-carbohydrate diet was followed and was primarily based on plant sources of protein and fat, we actually saw the opposite. There was a reduced risk of all-cause mortality and a reduced risk of heart disease death. So if you are going to follow the ketogenic diet, it is suggested that you get your fat sources primarily from plants. And in a future podcast, I will dive more into what is actually present in animal fats and how they can influence our health. Now, if following the ketogenic diet, the second thing to keep in mind is to still try to eat a lot of fiber and vegetables. Because the keto diet causes us to eliminate fruits and whole grains for the most part, we will lack a lot of nutrients, for example, fiber, vitamin A, vitamin C, and more. By eating a lot of low-carb veggies such as broccoli, cauliflower, leafy greens, Brussels sprouts, mushrooms, and bell peppers, for example, we can accommodate and still obtain some of those missing nutrients. It's also important to keep in mind to drink a lot of water while on this diet because you will lose a lot of water weight. Okay, so I hope that this podcast episode was very interesting and informative for all of you. So in brief summary, the ketogenic diet is a fasting mimetic diet that may have some health benefits in regard to mood disorders, epilepsy, and weight loss. But the clinical data is quite sparse. This diet can result in weight loss, but is hallmarked with rapid weight regain once going off the diet. This diet can be very restrictive, resulting in some nutrient deficiencies and side effects. So it is recommended to cycle through the ketogenic diet and a well-balanced diet. 
As well, it is important to still count your calories so that you do not increase your blood cholesterol levels and to consume your fat mostly from plant sources. Lastly, supplementation with medium chain triglyceride oils is proving to be scientifically very interesting for increasing blood ketone levels and improving cognitive function in Alzheimer's disease. In part two of this episode, we will cover all about the fascinating data coming out on intermittent fasting and how it flies in the face of nutritional dogma for the last several decades. Now, I'd love to hear your feedback on this episode. These are big topics that I'm trying to cover in a short time frame, and I'm hoping to make it understandable for everyone. So I'd love your feedback. Is the information too complex? You know, Do I need to simplify it more or do you want even more detail? So let me know. Okay, so that's a wrap for part one of this topic. Now that I've armed you with the scientific knowledge, it is up to you to take the best care of your body as possible, as I want all of us to live the healthy and fun lives that we want to live. Until the next episode, I hope you all have a super healthy week. Bye for now. I am a scientist simply sharing scientific evidence. Some of the clinical interventions I discuss are not appropriate for everyone. Before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle, please do consult the advice of your physician or dietitian. My opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of Mount Sinai Hospital and its affiliates.